was announced in our last session. Uh, I'll be introducing Jesse Prince's uh, trilogy uh, as part of, uh, of my ongoing uh, research program in uh, neurophilosophy, together with Professor Norman Madaraj. <clears throat> We've been developing different strands of uh, uh, research, ideas, uh, and problems to be dealt with. And it's been very interesting to realize how those different areas can have a very interesting interface and uh, relate to each other. For instance, last time we had Norman's presentation on Chomsky's uh, generative grammar and his uh, theory of language. And uh, this was also uh, relating to his previous uh, seminars on Daniel Dennett's Consciousness Explained. So you're going to see that what I'm going to be presenting here in this very brief uh, presentation, uh, doing uh, somehow a survey of what we did in our last edition of this seminar. Uh, we were particularly dealing with uh, Patricia Churchland's uh, book on uh, neurophilosophical uh, takes on um, moral philosophy. It's a book called Neuro uh, Neurotrust. But uh, I won't go into details for what we did in the past. Uh, since I asked you guys to read this uh, couple, this couple of uh, essays on uh, neuroscience and the philosophy of neuroscience. Uh, trying to uh, situate a philosophical discussion of neuroscientific problems precisely in light of this neuroscientific turn in philosophy of mind. Uh, I'm going to skip this uh, extensive recapitulation and uh, if you guys have any questions regarding some parts of, our, of my uh, PowerPoint presentation here, we can always talk about this in more detail. But to start uh, with the, uh, the presentation itself, uh, I'm trying to, uh, to use the reading, uh, or, or wherever you guys can read from uh, Jesse Prince's uh, trilogy, as a way to pave, pave the way for his uh, theory of consciousness. And of course, you're going to realize that uh, consciousness has been a big topic for uh, philosophy of mind uh, since the very beginning of philosophy of mind. Okay, uh, we, we spoke a little bit about Descartes. So we're going to go back to some of these uh, problems relating to dualism. But the idea here is to move, uh, to move on towards what would be a, a more robust and complex theory of a consciousness. So in my, in my personal uh, approach to, to this whole uh, subject, I was coming from a social, political, philosophical background. I won't go into detail now, but uh, Let's just assume that in neurophilosophy and in cognitive neuroscience, there is a way of talking about uh, social philosophy, or, or uh, what has been uh, called uh, the social brain problem. So as we try to move beyond these uh, neuro hypes, for instance, if you if you uh, Google uh, neuro terms, you get over 31 million uh, hits in less than. Uh, you know, half a second, here over uh, one-fifth of a second. Uh, but of course, we're not interested in uh, any kind of a fashion or uh, hypes relating to new terms. Our idea is precisely to go into uh, uh, interdisciplinary research as we are conducting, uh, working on this uh, uh, project funded by Brazilian National Research Council, CNPQ at the Brain Institute. So in this uh, ongoing uh, research, I'm trying to 
investigating what sense a social political constructivism, as we, we find this uh, in political philosophy, in Rawls, in a pragmatic normative reconstruction, as we find it, for instance, in Habermas and Honneth, may be taken as defensible instance of a weak or mitigated methodological social constructionism to the extent that both preserves the idea of objectivity and that can be articulated in terms of cognitive moral normativity. So already from the very uh, start, you're going to see that uh, you have this whole problem of dealing with objectivity as opposed to uh, subjectivity. And even as we are so aware of uh, subject-object dichotomies in dualism, still uh, it's understandable that if you're going to have a, a naturalistic approach, uh, especially thinking of the natural sciences, uh, it would be uh, very easy to simply fall into some kind of a simplistic opposition of naturalism to normativity and to say that, well, this is what philosophers or people relating to uh, you know, cultural studies <coughs> are doing. And of course, this is precisely what we are trying to avoid. Okay? We're not trying to make this uh, uh, oversimplification of saying, well, the sciences are dealing with things the way they really actually are. In, uh, the reality of things, while philosophers, poets, you know, and artists are simply you know, using their fancy imagination to, uh, to do all kinds of uh, you know, speculative uh, constructions. Precisely, when we talk about a weak or mitigated methodological social constructionism, the idea is precisely to see that there are certain things that do have more of a subjective element in these very uh, constructions, as opposed to, say, measures of uh, uh, atomic, astronomical, and uh, chemical uh, phenomena. Okay? But this is something that, little by little, depending on your own uh, background, it's going to become more and more clear to you. <clears throat> Overall, we can say that we, we've undergone this kind of a neuroscientific turn, or post-empirical turn, towards experimental philosophy is, for instance, we moved from traditional conception of bioethics and traditional conceptions of ethics towards neuroethics. Professor Sinara Nara is going to talk more about this in a while. In my own uh, research, I was trying to make sense of a social political conception as a democratic ethos, for instance, when you talk about the way society uh, shares uh, beliefs, uh, conceptions, a moral uh, sense of a justice, of a fairness, of saying that things are right or wrong. And besides all the philosophical, properly philosophical contributions, we are trying to deal with this intersection of a neurobiological account, <clears throat> for instance, when you talk about uh, homeostasis, and uh, the very conception of social brain in Gazzaniga. And uh, we try to recast this naturalism normativity debate uh, in social epistemic and procedural deliberative terms. So let me go uh, straight to the uh, to three points that I'd like to, uh, to talk about here. First of all, as we think of traditional understanding of uh, making this uh, decision-making process and the way we speak of a freedom of choice. Usually you think of a conscious, conscious intention that someone has an idea of doing something. Okay? Let's see. Doing X in order to get Y. <coughs> And moral areas activated in the brain would lead to a decision and then to the action. Okay? Now, with Benjamin Libet's experiments in the 80s, he was somehow demonstrating the absence, or at least was challenging, traditional conceptions of the free will in that the brain makes a decision prior to its becoming conscious. 
as you see here in the slide, this is a very uh, simple uh, skin. As you see in the head, you have this small uh, milliseconds uh, difference, you know, a small time lag in the way uh, moving a finger is something that is decided prior to a conscious uh, decision. Well, Antonio Damasio, this uh, Portuguese neuroscientist, argued that in response to uh, Libet's experiments, that saying, uh, well, moving a finger is not exactly the same thing of uh, making complex decisions, for instance, like choosing whom to marry. And of course, in these more complex decisions, we are already assuming many other decision-making uh, process that we're also involved. Also when you are driving, when you are doing all kinds of things that somehow you, you are seeing that, well, I wasn't even thinking of a turning right or turning left, I was doing, doing this more or less automatically. And precisely this is the point here. And that's how the unconscious and consciousness are going to be uh, playing together towards a uh, reformulation of a theory of consciousness. But we're going to see that the traditional understanding of this whole thing, going back to Descartes' uh, famous uh, meditations from uh, 1641, I think therefore I am, especially this uh, Cogito uh, uh, formula, is going to be revisited. This is precisely the starting point, as we mentioned in our first day of, uh, of classes. And uh, you're going to read, for instance, in, uh, in this recently published Blackwell Companion to Consciousness, anything that we are aware of this is uh, at a given moment forms part of our consciousness, making conscious experience at once the most familiar and the most mysterious aspect of our lives. So this idea of the mystery of consciousness, as uh, Dennett says, in his, in his book, remains uh, one of the last mysteries to be dealt with. Okay? We had mysteries of the origins of life, how the world or the cosmos began, how uh, life uh, takes place, the emergence of life, and all different kinds of uh, mysteries that have been somehow, or to a certain extent, explained by scientific discoveries and theories. And consciousness, nevertheless, remains a mystery. We have, in the uh, very beginning of the 80s, a modern-day version of uh, this kind of a problem uh, formulated by Hilary Putnam as brain in a vet. I don't know how many of you guys have thought about this. Usually philosophers have to do with this kind of a problem. But if you watch it, if you saw any of the movies like uh, Blade Runner, The Matrix, and several other movies that could be using the same kind of principle, especially The Matrix, which was uh, the trilogy of The Matrix, was very much based on this kind of experiment. If you think of Descartes' evil demon, uh, where an imagined illusionist bent on tricking Descartes about absolutely everything, including his own existence, the card would observe even an infinitely powerful evil demon couldn't trick me into thinking that I myself existed if I didn't exist. Therefore, if I think, I am. Okay, so uh, this is a Dennett uh, a summary of, uh, of uh, this experiment. Uh, if you take this in logical terms, Cogito ergo sum, thinking is part of uh, existence, you may formulate it. It's one possible way, of course, it is very controversial, and we can talk about more about this a later on. But the idea here, you're going to see that, for instance, a Sartre or you know, existentialist thought that this is precisely the best way of making sense of the Cartesian cognitive. Okay, that, in that thinking is just a subset of existence, right? You cannot think if you do not exist. But of course, this was not the way Descartes was proposing this whole thing with a theory of substance. 
And his idea is that you have a thinking substance and a, a material or corporeal existence. Therefore, even though he introduced the mind in lieu of uh, the soul, it was still an ontological substance dualism. We're going to talk more about this. You see now the controversy already going on in the 90s, especially between Dennett and Searle. As uh, Dennett, when he wrote a uh, very interesting uh, review of uh, Searle's book, The Mystery of Consciousness, Searle and I have a deep disagreement about how to study the mind. For Searle, it is all really quite simple. There are these bedrock time-tested intuitions we all have about consciousness, and any theory that challenges them is just preposterous. I, on the contrary, think that the persistent problem of consciousness is going to remain a mystery until we find some such dead obvious intuition and show that, in spite of first appearances, it is false. Okay, this is typical then at his best, right? It's, it's very sarcastic about it. And uh, of course, in Searle's uh, reply, uh, addressing uh, Dennett's provocation, to make explicit the difference between conscious events and, for example, mountains and molecules, I said consciousness has a first person or subjective ontology. So again, we're going, we have to go back to this whole thing of a first person. You're going to see that uh, this is going to become uh, quite uh, complex, even as we move towards the, uh, the linguistic uh, perspectivism in terms of a phenomenality. By that, I mean that conscious states only exist when experienced by a subject and that they exist only from the first person point of view of that subject. In his book, Consciousness Explained, Dennett denies the existence of consciousness, period. So it's like saying, one is talking about consciousness as an illusion, namely Dennett. The other one is trying to make sense of consciousness by resorting to a first person account, right? This is phenomenal uh, consciousness. We're going to unpack this, uh, this very uh, problem. So as we go back to Damasio's uh, Descartes' error uh, book, which was uh, like a blockbuster in, uh, in the philosophy of mind, you know, for someone coming from the neuroscience, a scientist, a uh, neuroscientist, he's not a <coughs> philosopher by training, and uh, he was trying to, uh, uh, to challenge traditional conceptions of human nature as he, he argued that both the nature we inherited as a pack of genetically engineered adaptations and the nature we have acquired in individual development, therefore nature and nurture, through interactions with our social environment mindfully and willfully as well as not, these are part of the same neurobiological process that neuroscience is dealing with. In, uh, in this uh, already in the 1991 uh, uh, book by uh, Dennett, you have this uh, uh, critic of the idea of the Cartesian theater, the very metaphor that the master is going to resort to when he's talking about consciousness. Human consciousness is just about the last surviving mystery. As I said, this, was, this is in the very beginning of, of the book, for uh, uh, Dennett's book. There is no Cartesian theater. There are just multiple drafts composed by process of content fixation, playing various semi-independent roles in the brain's larger economy of controlling a human body's journey through life. Now, as we go back to, uh, 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 to Damasio, and, and it's very interesting to, to think of a date. You have uh, parallel developments in uh, interlocutions, discussions, going on in the philosophy of mind, neurosciences, and cognitive sciences, right? <clears throat> so, as you're going to see that uh, some of the folks 
in this uh, upper level here, you know, they are not really dialoguing with uh, neuroscientists, right? This is precisely what we're trying to avoid here. We are really trying to have a, a, an open, uh, honest interlocution between different proposals. Okay, and uh, as I as I mentioned to you guys, we also have another big uh, discussion here relating to analytic versus uh, continental and especially phenomenological accounts so of philosophy that? of mind. But what's that? Analytic versus... Uh, continental philosophy? Continental philosophy. Yes, in the very first day of class I said that uh, the analytic tradition is the tradition that comes from uh, Frege, Wittgenstein, Russell and others, okay, more. So it's usually identified with Anglo-American schools of philosophy, right? But the division is not only uh, political, uh, geopolitical, it's not only to say, well, these guys are more, you know, uh, in English-speaking countries, and they also tend to uh, minimize the role of culture and history as opposed to a continental philosophy, as you see the word continental refers to the European continent, right? The UK is uh, an island, right? A bunch of uh, few islands. Uh, and uh, the idea here is precisely to go beyond this uh, geographical or uh, cultural opposition and to think that in terms of uh, development, Analytic philosophy began with the development of the analysis of language. In order to avoid pseudo-problems, for instance, when uh, Wittgenstein said that you no know, language was on vacation, to say that you know, some, when people are you know, talking about problems that do not even relate to real phenomena, uh, the way you know, scientists will talk about uh, you know, natural phenomena, or the way uh, social problems that do not relate to real problems, these would be pseudo problems. So in order to avoid pseudo problems, we need an analysis of language. So this is identified with a linguistic term in contemporary philosophy. Now, for uh, phenomenology, it's very interesting that, uh, starting with Husserl and then uh, Heidegger, language was already a, a big issue, except that as opposed to a linguistic term itself, we, we may also speak of a semantic term, and especially hermeneutic term in, uh, in Heidegger's uh, being entire. Okay. So this is a long story made short. Uh, but again, uh, uh, in uh, Damasio's writings that will uh, succeed his first uh, ideas in the court error, he's going to uh, develop a theory of emotions as perception of pattern changes in the body. So this is very much based in uh, William James' conception of bodily changes. Uh, to deal, uh, to account for emotions, contributing to reasoning, action, and election of ends. And the idea here is to see that uh, Joseph Prince, in the very beginning of a, uh, of his uh, idea of a rewriting a, a trilogy. To uh, Dave Hume's book on uh, human nature treatise of human nature so the first one is, is dealing with a theory of our uh, representations okay, to deal with the problem of understanding this just as uh, Hume did and the second book is dealing with problems of fashion so in, in his case emotions. And the third one, uh, this emotional construction of our morals. 
just as Hume did in his uh, third book of his trilogy. So Damasio is going to say that uh, he began writing Descartes' error in order to propose that reason may not be as pure as most of us think it is or wish it were, that emotions and feelings may not be intruders in the bastion of reason at all. They may be enmeshed in its network for worse or for the better. The strategies of human reason probably did not develop in either evolution or any single individual without the guiding force of the mechanisms of biological regulation of which emotion and feeling are notable expressions. Moreover, even after reasoning strategies become established in the formative years, their effective deployment probably depends to a considerable extent on the continued ability to experience feelings. So this is, uh, you know, I'll go straight to the, uh, uh, to the crux of the argument, which is the very last, uh, the bottom line here. First of all, you have emotions, you know, uh, to be dealt with in both cognitive and non-cognitive volitional features, meaning that you have unconscious and conscious aspect, aspects uh, in order to come up with a theory of emotions. And in his uh, book, Self Comes to Mind, he's going to argue that the biological evolution of the brain is what's going to help us understand the social evolution of mind itself accounting for the emergence of self and mind plus self equals consciousness. So this is a very good way of uh, putting this. But of course this is not satisfactory for most philosophers. Okay? Perhaps for you know, people in the medical science this, is, this could be more uh, you know, a, 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 you know, something uh, innovative. But of course mind plus self equals a consciousness this is not satisfactory because you could argue that already even uh, in Descartes or in Cartesian uh, substance dualism, you have a conception of a self, a conception of a consciousness, which is precisely emerging out of this uh, thinking substance, the cogito, right? And you could still say, well, uh, you know, how come you're going to Say, for instance, uh, as materialists, we will argue that there is nothing besides matter. Because the, the first uh, common sense, actually, uh, understanding of naturalism is that we are trying to eliminate the supernatural, right? When you say that we are for naturalism or uh, materialism, it means that you're getting rid of uh, supernatural uh, explanations or accounts uh, for natural phenomena. But it is perfectly possible to conceive of dualisms without resorting to a substance dualism. We're going to see this, how this is possible in, uh, in, in philosophy. So you know that uh, in uh, Professor Damasio's uh, research, he began with this whole thing of a gauges uh, experiment, no thanks to uh, Hannah Damasio's reconstruction of this uh, accident, this old worker who was, had his uh, skull perforated by uh, an iron bar, and uh, this allowed to see that this individual, even though he had perfect uh, cognitive uh, uh, capabilities, you know, still uh, working properly, his uh, social uh, and uh, moral decision-making process were affected. So the idea is that deficit in reasoning is secondary to deficit in emotional processing. So he had a difficulty with planning in the immediate, in the, in the future. That's why he, he was fired, he lost his job. No longer able to make personally advantageous decisions. And uh, he sustained social, personal, economic losses. His family uh, left him. He, he, uh, he became someone like a social outcast. So uh, the uh, explanation is precisely by uh, observing that the prefrontal cortex and especially the ventral medial prefrontal cortex were affected and therefore uh, this is something that could be located in a specific region, a region as you see uh, 
on the picture there of the frontal brain. So uh, for the basic emotions, uh, Damasio could resort to all the uh, new uh, technological innovations, especially neuroimaging and especially functional magnetic resonance uh, imaging that measures brain activity by detecting associated change in, in, in blood flow. So this is the major way of trying to establish neural correlations or the neural basis for emotional responses. And uh, his feeling theory, therefore, is going to combine these aborted states of a James Lund uh, psychological theories with the neuroscientific uh, experiments that could allow for this reconstruction of disorder, object <coughs> perception, change, emotional uh, bodily change, and uh, feelings as a second order reflexive account of, uh, of emotions. So Damasio's as if loop is uh, formulated in his idea of uh, the somatic marker hypothesis is precisely that for several uh, situations where decisions could not be uh, made only in rational, uh, cold ways, uh, they would be, uh, they would benefit from the fact that these uh, choice go straight as though they were uh, uh, skipping these uh, rational uh, procedures in order to make some kind of a decision. So in this case, somatic markers can help someone make a decision. Somatic markers are associations between reinforcing stimuli that induce an associated physiological affective state so as to guide behavior in favor of more advantageous choice and therefore they are adaptive. Okay, we have uh, several examples even when you're riding a car or a bicycle or driving a car. Yes, Fabrizio. Um, one of the things that I always wonder about Damasio and um, I mean, last year when I was working on that for the dissertation, I was struggling with this a bit, is this notion that um, there is such a thing as a more advantageous set uh, that is operative almost a-consciously. I don't want even to say unconsciously, I want to say a-consciously so we don't pollute it with a, a, a different set of analysis, which is not what Damasio is doing, no. but it seems it's operative a-consciously in a way that is moving you towards the more advantageous choice. And this is my problem here. We are, we are admitting that there is a position within just that can be adjectified within nature. And by adjectified, I'm saying more advantageous. Right. I mean, how? Uh, it just, from, from a purely phenomenological point of view, it makes no sense for me. Uh, I mean, how can it be more advantageous in an unconscious level? I mean, it doesn't make sense. It puts, uh, even if we want to put, to think of Damasio himself writing this book, okay? So, if Damasio made choices when he was writing this book that were more advantageous towards the process of writing this book, and they were decided unconsciously, what he's saying is that the progress of mind was necessary towards him writing that book. It's in the peak of possibilities. Yeah, and, I, I and, see your point. And, and I, that's I, kind of yeah. too cyberpunk for me. I mean, I, 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 I can't wrap my mind around it with, without some pollution. I mean, there ought to be some sort of pollution there that allows us to say, okay, more adventures here is not from the standpoint of the mind. The mind cannot by itself think of something, oh, okay, by fiat, that is more adventures. Okay, Fabrice, right? let, let's, let's go straight to the point. When you are breathing, when your stomach, when all the different parts of your body are functioning, this is what he means by the unconscious or the not conscious. Of course, unconscious has nothing to do with Lacan and psychoanalysis. Yeah, sure. Please. Unconscious means not conscious. Okay. That's what it means here. So the idea for Damasio is precisely to say that uh, 
I can see your point if you are thinking in terms of saying that this is for the benefit of anything. But to make, uh, uh, in a very simplistic sense, his argument, uh, his idea is that uh, life itself is the benefit. So surviving is better than not surviving. Okay, that's, that's enough for him. Okay, in biological terms, the benefit is, when you speak of adaptation, etc., etc., say to be, to uh, persist in life. This is good enough to persist in, uh, persist in biological. In being okay, that, that's yeah, that's, that's, that's good point. enough for him. Uh, From yeah. a biological standpoint, that's all that matters. But that's not the example with the Iowa game. But, yeah, yeah, but then, then if you if you go into writing this book, then he would say, well, this is already a second order kind of, you're already assuming that someone has a desire, you're already on this level of something that has been uh, constructed in terms of a cultural, civilizational uh, process. It's much more uh, complex. You're already assuming that you have consciousness. But we, we're going to go back to okay, this. Yeah. Uh, please, let's keep this question because we're still in the very beginning. Okay. Just to make a... Uh, uh, this is, a, a, of course, a very long, complex uh, formulation for Damasio himself. If you think here of uh, different levels in the very evolution of the brain, when you get here to neocortex, neocortical uh, layers to form this uh, complex uh, structure of the brain as we have a consciousness, we have already assumed this uh, somewhat unconscious or a primitive conscious or proto-consciousness uh, that Damaggio is going to talk about for animal evolution, biological evolution leading to this more sophisticated complex evolution. That, that's why it's, uh, it, it's not fair to just you know, uh, skip from one level to the other. But, uh, but I, see, I can see your point when we go back to more philosophical uh, speculations about this. But, but let me make this very clear. It's one thing to, to think of a, a neuroscientist writing about this and to see how uh, you know, philosophers you know, are going to be dealing with some of these problems. Because, of course, I can see where, where you have a point there. But we're going to go back to this uh, later on. Brain damage affecting personality, decision making, control of action, risk aversion, motivation, impulsiveness, etc. All these aspects of us depend on our neurobiology. That's the point. Okay. Yeah, sure. So this is uh, it's the uh, let's say that's the starting point for uh, understanding the neuroscientific turn in uh, psychiatry, psychology, and uh, psychoanalysis itself, but also for philosophy of mind. Okay. This was the point in my paper. Okay. The, I, I, I sent you two uh, two versions of the paper. One version that was published by Sinara, another one that came out in that book I sent to you, the yeah, book on naturalism and uh, normativity. <clears throat> so, uh, but even here we have this, uh, this whole problem of uh, third person accounts of meaning and selfhood as opposed to I thou encounters or first person personage accounts, okay, I, me, self, etc. So this, this can become very complex, especially if you go into psychoanalysis and to differentiate between different categories. We're not going into these particular details now. Let's try first of all to have a, a, a broader uh, overview of uh, the problem of consciousness. So third personal interpreter relative account of meaning and mind, according to Barry Smith, this was a talk he gave here last year, neglects the contribution that first-personal and sub-personal aspects of a speaker's competence make to the signif significance of speech. However, Davidson's own work contains materials that point towards a more speaker-centered account of meaning by adding experience to Davidson's scenario of tri triangulation we can bridge the publicly interpretable content of a speaker's utter utterances and the immediate first-person accessibility they have to the speaker. So this is just to see that in all different accounts, at different moments in the development of different accounts for consciousness or theories 
of a philosophy of mind, you have different problems being raised. <clears throat> and that's why the problem of consciousness is going to remain so complicated. Because it's like saying that, well, we have to assume all the, the other problems that are also taking place. And, and, and I, I found this particularly interesting uh, by uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, taking part in Professor Madarash's presentations uh, last semester because we could see that even at the, uh, Dennett went back to some of his earlier formulations because you see in uh, 20 years or 30 years lots of things have happened. Okay? So uh, it, it's really very dense and complex. So the idea for Damasio, uh, you know, uh, two decades later, as he's going towards this conception of self and consciousness, is that consciousness is that most of the decisions important for one's life are not made in the same way we decide to move a finger, as he had said before. In the very beginning, he was already reacting against any kind of reductionist, physicalist account of naturalism. The difference is that we deliberate on the more important decisions for long periods of time. They don't occur in the moment of execution of the action. So he's going to talk in the feeling of what happens, that emotions can be induced in a non-conscious manner and thus appear to the conscious self as seemingly unmotivated. So to uh, make it very uh, short, this explanation, consciousness comes down to a mind endowed with subjectivity mind endowed with subjectivity. Consciousness is a state of mind in which there is a knowledge of one's existence and of the existence of one's surroundings. Milieu. Now, that's the way he's going to talk about it. Now, Jesse Prince, who was in a very interesting interlocution with Damasio and neuroscientists, cognitive scientists here, and philosophers of mind, he's going to make this whole thing even more complex and complicated. But he's coming up with a theory of his own. That's why, the idea. Why doesn't Jasper uh, refer to Damasio's work? Oh, several passages. Several passages. Several passages. His, his second book is completely based on Damasio's theory of, uh, of emotions. And his book, the one that I want to talk about, The Conscious Brain, has an entire section devoted to Damasio where he makes a critique of Damasio. You know, just to have an idea, I, I'm, the reason why I, I chose Prince's account is that, to my mind, his account so far is the most complete and so far, in my opinion, he has the best argument. So I'm still waiting for other books to come out. But the last book, you know, I, the last word in terms of theory of consciousness, his account is excellent. You know, it's, it's very complete because he's examining all the previous accounts that were presented in the last three decades. So that's why you know, his account, since it's the, one of the latest books on our consciousness, is the best one so far. But let's, let, let, let's uh, wait till we, we, we go back into some of these problems. In the, in the first book of his trilogy, he's making a case for concept empiricism. So the idea here is how to avoid traditional theories of representation, traditional conceptions of language, and uh, come up with some new conception of concepts. Human concepts are copies or combinations of copies of perceptual representations. Perceptual representation itself is a representation in a dedicated input system. So this is very much what you find in uh, classical empiricism, right? You have you know, the idea of the uh, Tabula rasa, okay, or the blank slate. Uh, you have an input, output, right? So you, you think of a sense or sensory perception of data, and this is what's gonna uh, give you uh, representations through uh, imagination. Impressions, of course, it was the, the first one. Uh, ideas, concepts, etc. Okay. It's against against innate accounts of uh, thought. For instance, in Descartes, 
Okay, this was the very first day of class. I don't know how many of you were not here or if you didn't grasp this. The very problem of uh, innate ideas in the car was the starting point for John Locke's empiricist theory of mind. Okay? So against Cartesian innate ideas, so Cartesian or Descartes, innate ideas, so called intuitions, you have empiricism. So this is called rationalism. This is important to keep in mind because as a professor Madarash is uh, developing his argument for Chomsky's recasting of Cartesian uh, linguistic, uh, linguistic or semantic theory of a language, uh, uh, or syntactical, even better, uh, uh, recasting of, uh, of uh, innate uh, conceptions, the, uh, the counter-arguments or the, uh, the other ones that could be contrasted with is the first one would be the empiricist models, right? So Hume together with Locke belongs here okay, for those of you who are coming from non-philosophical backgrounds. Emotions is a form of perception, writes a prince in his uh, second book gut reactions. Having an emotion is literally perceiving our relationship to the world. Like perceptions, emotions can be inaccurate or even unjustified, but they also can be revelatory. So emotions come down to gut reactions. The theory that I defend is not entirely new. It is a variation of an account that was pioneered by William James and Carl Langer and has recently been resuscitated by Antonio Damasio. This is Prince writing about Damasio. According to this tradition, emotions are perceptions of pattern changes in the body. Theories of this kind have never been popular in philosophy or psychology. They seem ill-equipped to explain many of the things that a theory of emotion should account for. Most notably, they fail to explain the significance of emotions. Emotions contribute to reasoning, action, and the election of aims. Emotions can even enter awareness before we have consciously accessed the subtle cues that trigger them. This is why we describe emotions as gut reactions. They are like bodily radar detectors that alert us to concerns. When we listen to our emotions, we are not being swayed by meaningless feelings, nor are we hearing the cold dictates of complex judgments. We are using our bodies to perceive our position in the world. This last phrase, it sounds very much like Merleau-Ponty. So if you are uh, familiarized with uh, phenomenology, you see that uh, Prince is somewhere in the middle. He, he has an analytic philosophical uh, training in philosophy of psychology, but he's also very much uh, you know, open towards uh, phenomenological accounts. So finally, our, our third point, Revisiting our sense of ourselves. As we revise our sense of ourselves, our ordinary folk psychology, aren't we also revisiting our most common sense intuitions, both moral and social, such as a sense of justice? So here I, I recall that one of the first texts, perhaps it's considered the first classical text for uh, contemporary problems or theories of consciousness, Thomas Nagel's what is it like to be a bat from 1974? And in neuroscience, the social brain from 1985. We talked about this text in previous editions of our seminar. For Prince, he's going to refer to NetBlock's phenomenal consciousness, where P consciousness is experience. So phenomenal consciousness equals experience. Phenomenal conscious properties are experiential properties. Phenomenal conscious states are experiential, that is, a state is phenomenal, is phenomenal conscious if it has experiential properties. The totality of the experiential properties of a state are what it is like to have it. Moving from synonyms to examples, we have be conscious states when we see, hear, smell, taste, and have pains. So it's going to be always a first-person-ish account. 
Now, later on, you're going to have uh, Rosenfalls and uh, other people that are going to be revisiting McDowell and, and different nuanced conceptions, like these ones uh, opposing thick to thin phenomenality. For instance, thick phenomenality, the subjective occurrence of mental qualities, as opposed to thin phenomenality, the occurrence of qualitative character without there also being anything it's like for one to have that qualitative character. In a word, thick phenomenality is just thin phenomenality together with there being something it's like for one to have that thin phenomenality. So you see that this is very tricky, the way, and also we're going to have different terminology. It's always going to make things more complicated. We use higher order consciousness to uh, allude uh, to uh, thick phenomenality. But we think, as, you, as I mentioned to you, that other people were already talking about this, like uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, already in 1943. And I'm using Sartre as an example for uh, the phenomenological account, because he, he referred to what he called the, the three ages. The three ages. Toisach, in French, right? Hegel, Rousseau, and Heidegger. And therefore, I don't have to go through a Hegel, Rousseau, and Heidegger. If you, if you read Sartre, it's enough to understand what's at stake here. Because he's going to take the idea of consciousness as a being whose existence posits its essence, and inversely, it is consciousness of a being whose essence implies its existence. That is, in which appearance lays claim to being. Being is everywhere. So that's the title of the book, Let Illinea, Being in a Nothingness. So if you take being itself versus the for itself, you're going to see that our consciousness is going to be taken as being for itself, Ursula. Nothingness, not a thing, a wind blowing from nowhere towards the world. And this is a phenomenological uh, reconstruction where being in itself thinks this is what's given uh, in the world as ontology in the traditional conception of uh, things that exist. And of course, Sartre is deliberately uh, giving a atheistic reading of the cogito to affirm that if there were a God, our essence would precede our existence, as Descartes thought. And God would give us a functional purpose when he created us. Since there is no God, our existence must precede our essence. We just find ourselves existing and must then create our own essence. So that's his idea of a self creation, etc. Very Nietzschean or Kierkegaardian in this sense. Consciousness is a being who, whose existence posits its essence. It is consciousness of a being whose essence implies its existence, etc. So uh, uh, we'll see that in a, in a prince third book of uh, the trilogy, he's uh, paving the way precisely in this uh, cultural level, second order, reflexive level of a consciousness, where you have the normative domain of morality. But you see, this is already presupposing all the neurobiological evolutionary uh, steps in a long process that leads from uh, you know, uh, uh, primates in uh, different uh, forms uh, that preceded our neocortical uh, brain. In, uh, in Patricia uh, Churchland, uh, uh, in her writings, and recalling that uh, neurophilosophy came out in 1986, you know, just to keep track of these uh, dates, it's really, the first one's already going to be 30 years old, what we humans call ethics or morality is a four-dimensional scheme for social behavior that is shaped by interlocking brain process, caring, recognition of other psychological states, problem solving in a social context, and learning social practice. So her own account of sociality, sociability, is itself informed by neurobiology. And therefore, she is one of the first ones to uh, promote this neuroscientific turn in philosophy of mind. And I, this was particularly in her book on uh, ethics, moral values ground a life that is a social life. At the root of human moral practice are the social desires. 
most fundamentally, these involve attachment to family members, care for friends, the need to belong. Motivated by these values, individually and collectively, we try to solve problems that can cause misery and instability and threaten survival. Once again, responding to uh, Fabricius' uh, remarks, uh, Churchland is going to be very much like the Mazu in this sense. Why we're speaking of survival as well, this is the meaning of life is to keep life going, right? Since our brains are organized to value self-welfare as well as welfare of kith and kin, acquaintance and uh, family members, conflicts frequently arise between the needs of self and the needs of others. So that's how we come full circle and go back to a uh, you know, uh, social political conception of sense of justice and uh, in this uh, so-called reflective equilibrium, seeing how uh, Humean accounts, okay, here we have two extremes, Plato as opposed to Hume. So in Plato's so-called moral realism or ontological realism, we have the very beginning of this dualistic version that's going to be championed by uh, Descartes. Okay, so Cartesian dualism is just following this uh, platonic opposition of uh, a realm of ideas, of things as they are in themselves, as opposed to the sensible world of appearances, right? The phenomenal world. And here we have another, another extreme, a completely different uh, conception in David Hume precisely because he was trying to naturalize all these traditional arguments of metaphysics. So uh, we see that this is a very complex approach in a, if we were to come up with a science of consciousness, no longer only as a philosophy of consciousness, but as a neurophilosophy of consciousness that would take account of a neuroscientific contributions as you see here in this interesting uh, model of the interdisciplinary research involving not only neuroscience and philosophy, but also psychology, linguistics, anthropology, and artificial intelligence, just to name six of them, you know, of uh, major fields for this interdisciplinary research, we can think of different uh, formulations of dualism. For instance, dualism of property, where the existence of conscious properties are neither identical nor redu reductible to physical properties, but which may nevertheless be instantiated by the very same things that instantiate physical properties. We also have epif epiphenomenalism, in that there are causal <coughs> influence of brain on the mental states, but not the reverse, right? So when you are thinking, well, what's going on in the brain? Is this what caused something to, uh, you know, to be a... Uh, perceived as a mental state. Well, this is uh, an epiphenomenalist approach. And finally, functionalism, and this is one of the most complicated and tricky ones, trickiest ones. What there is identical in two different cerebral occurrences from the same mental state, it is the function. So uh, if we move beyond you know, classical functionalism, we're going to have more uh, sophisticated as uh, Joseph Prince on a neurofunctional attended intermediate level representational theory of consciousness. All conscious states arise in the same way, according to Prince. Attention sends information from sensory systems into working memory. So consciousness is assumed to be a phenomenal consciousness, the very way we define uh, thing, thing, phenomenality. Phenomenal consciousness is perceptual because he's taken to his uh, trilogy, right, where he mapped this uh, transformation naturalism in this uh, concept empiricism. So phenomenal consciousness is perceptual. Representation of vehicles belong to one of the sense: touch, vision, audition, affection, and so forth. All conscious states comprise mental representations in that thought are perceptually represented. Okay. So, uh, if you, I, I think I'm going to stop here because uh, I've already distributed this uh, handout and uh, I'll ask you guys to, uh, to what we can do now in order to, uh, to have a 
a few minutes for our discussion is to just take a quick look at this uh, handout, you know, read just a couple of our paragraphs. Uh, could someone read the very first paragraph in the conscious brain? In the conscious brain, just brings provide an update statement of this care attended the intermediate level of presentation, theory of consciousness, and investigates some implications of his account for a variety of traditional issues in consciousness studies. The book seems aimed at an interdisciplinary audience and is intended to guide the digestible by academics from a variety of backgrounds, the theory itself being generated from and tested against data drawn from animal and human neurosciences whilst being applied to problems both in philosophy. Thank you. It's intended to be. Okay, you, you might you might correct it here, okay? And it's intended to be not to buy of course to buy. Replace the Y. Yes, uh, this is a very good summary, right? Someone else please read uh, this, the second paragraph. What is the air theory? There are a variety of statements of the central explanatory hypothesis, uh, each committed to more or less detail regarding the implementation in the brain of particular cognitive functions of types of representation. The central tenet of the, of the hypothesis, which appears in all of these statements, is that consciousness is, it is that consciousness is attending to certain kinds of mental representations, those called intermediate level representations. The hypothesis is then developed by providing an account of these intermediate level representations and the mechanisms by which we attend to them. Although this account is provided at both a cognitive and a neural level of description, here I will focus on the cognitive level so as to keep this review to a readable lab. Thank you. Someone else could read the third paragraph. I'm going to do just another couple of paragraphs and then stop. Mm -hmm. What are intermediate level representations? Following Jackdoff presupposes that sensory systems employ three types of representation organized into a processing hierarchy, hence the talk of levels. Focusing on vision, Prince suggests that the low level is analogous to a pixel array. At the low level, objects are not represented, but rather the features of objects are. Here we get representation of things like edges and luminous blobs. Intermediate level representations provide representations of the objects presented to us from a particular point of view, i.e. from where one is located. High level representations also represent objects, but in a viewpoint independent way. For example, if one walks around a parrot in a cage, the intermediate level representation of that parrot keeps changing as it is viewed from different angles. The high level representation in contracts remains the same. It is the intermediate level representation which, according to the AIR hypothesis, is the conscious representation. Not all intermediate level representations are conscious, however. So, how does one become conscious? Very good. Excellent. Uh, someone else could read the, the, the fourth paragraph? In short, according to AIR, it is intended to in other words, attending to the intermediate level representation is necessary and sufficient for making an unconscious percept conscious. What then is attention? For Prince, attention is a change in the processing of intermediate levels for level representations that makes them available for encoding in working memory. Where to be encoded in working memory is for the intermediate level representation to be maintained in sensory cortical areas. It is important, however, that it is not actually being encoded in memory, in working memory, being maintained, that makes an intermediate level representation cautious. It is its mere avail availability to working memory which constitutes consciousness. Thank you. Well, let's stop here for a while. 
as you see, it's, it's very uh, uh, complex, very sophisticated, but that's why I highly recommend the reading of this book, even if you haven't read Dennett's, Searles, Nagel's, and all the other guys that were mentioned here, or even if you didn't have any kind of a background uh, in philosophy of mind, but the major reason why we, uh, you know, we decided to go and uh, go ahead and, uh, and face the reading of, of this book is that it's part of our ongoing uh, research program to develop different uh, interfaces. And I'm very glad that you know, at this point, after you know, uh, several editions of this seminar, we are you know, dealing with a very complex uh, theory here. So what do you guys make of this? Please, uh, feel free to say anything to, uh, you know, starting from your spontaneous uh, comments, uh, reactions, or questions. Please, we, we are here to, uh, you know, to socialize uh, information, uh, you know, uh, first person experience, etc. Uh, while we are on the topic, I am flooding everybody's inbox with materials regarding Nita Mark's presentation right. as it's going along. Uh, it's going to be all available on the website either Wednesday or Thursday, depending on YouTube's goodwill. Uh, but just so you know, if it's flooding you too much and you prefer that I only do it online, let me know. I'm just doing that for my own organization too, otherwise I lose the materials. But just let me know. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> okay, just so. Okay, uh, that so just on the topic of socialization. <laughs> no, that's okay because it's hard to take notes and to pay attention at the same time. I'm, a, I'm not able to do that. Or I pay attention to the class, or I take notes. I don't, I can't do both. <laughs> right. Sure. Okay, but what do you make? of this uh, contention that, uh, first of all, he, he's writing the book with this title, Conscious Brain, as opposed to Dave Chalmers, The Conscious Mind. Okay? He deliberately chose to do this. And it was one of the first receptions, which is also on the internet, is a Chalmers response. So the whole thing is on the internet. The Fabrice is doing this for you to make your work easier. But if you Google prints, in Chalmers and all the other things, or prints and consciousness, you're going to find lots of materials. Several lectures, you know, I had several clips, video clips, you know, selected, uh, you know, for uh, the website that I, I'm maintaining. But, of course, I, I decided not to include them because we have, uh, you know, a time constraint. You know, uh, we have to stop at 10.30 so that Sunara is going to give her talk. So, questions. Do, Nita, what, what do you make of this idea that uh, uh, consciousness uh, is uh, attentive or attending to attention uh, intermediate uh, representations, lady? I think there there is a problem there, which I would I would claim I would like to claim is on a philosophical language a phenomenological problem, which is this this uh, this approximation between the level of presentation of matter to mind and representation of matter to mind because I think there is something that happens in between these two stages both on a temporal level and if you want to call this temporal level culture fine uh, my, my problem is that I, I have a problem with starting with the level of the necessary the necessity of presentation concluding stuff about the necessity of representation uh, and I, that's what sometimes gets me uncomfortable because I agree with everything you said about the primacy of self-preservation, for example. But I think that that's done on a presentational right. level. Uh, however, uh, why do I think there is a problem of a gap here uh, or not taking the gap in consideration? Uh, Waldenfels would call it uh, right. the... Yeah. Um, the, um, the how do you call it? The jet lag of constitution, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so the problem here is, take the I.O. gambling task. We're no longer talking about self-preservation in that case. And I think that Damasio wants to point that our choices regarding the bats are done on a mimetic 
a conscious level that we made we made the choice for the more advantageous set before we made the choice for the more advantageous set. So this is what I mean by uh, getting from the level of presentational straight into the level of representation, as if there was no memory, as if there was no culture in between those yeah, levels. This is his point, and it's also principle. There is memory and encoding. Yeah, that's precisely what they're saying. I think that the major difficulty, I think, that that's, let me try to, uh, to dialogue with you, to really have a conversation with what you are saying here. Given our common phenomenological, philosophical background, I think it's the tendency for any one of us who have been uh, trained in philosophy or in phenomenology to start from this uh, first person account, including uh, uh, for consciousness. Uh, for instance, when you draw this distinction between a, a presentation and uh, anything that would come up uh, later as a theory of constitution, etc., as in Husserl. He's already uh, assuming this a phenomenological attitude. I'm not sure that a scientist has to do this. Or I mean, I, I'm not sure that he'll buy into this. You know, I, I can understand the point. And in the case of Prince, he's very open to uh, phenomenological uh, provocations, as I said. But I think that for anyone that's coming from uh, this uh, neuroscientific approach or perspective, they are trying to make sense of the phenomenon of consciousness by from the very outset, as uh, Dennett said, molecules and uh, rocks and things out there, these are precisely what are out there and they are not conscious of me or they are not informing anything, they are not helping us any, any, in any manner to develop a theory of consciousness. So I, I can see that uh, starting from uh, the philosopher's account or Husserl's account, it's a, a decision or you know, it's a, a way of, of doing things. But uh, of course, you already are privileging the, uh, you know, the phenomenological account itself. I don't know if, 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 you, if you follow me there or if, if you, what you make of this. Because for instance, in, in Husserl's, just, just to, to make this uh, clear for everyone who, who doesn't come from a philosophical background, phenomenology itself has been defined as the science of consciousness, right? From the very time of Hegel, in Hegel, already in the uh, uh, you know, uh, beginning of 19th century, 1808, in his Phenomenology of the Spirit, he's, he speaks of a phenomenology as the science of consciousness. So when Husserl goes back to this idea of a science of our consciousness, he's trying to do this as a mathematician, as a philosopher, trying to make sense of how objects or representations of our objects become an object for a thinking subject. And he, he starts from this assumption of uh, Brentano that all consciousness is consciousness of something. So it's the idea of aboutness. Mm -hmm. So uh, Prince and other people who are speaking in the 21st century, they, they, uh, they respect this uh, position. But they say, well, wait a minute, I cannot assume that you know, I'm doing this work because I'm a philosopher. I'm in a better position to do anything. I have to, uh, to respond to Damasio and to, you know, to neuroscientists dealing with consciousness. But again, we, you saw extremes. One extreme is to entirely deny consciousness. And this was what Searle thought that Dennett was doing. Say, consciousness is simply an illusion. Okay, it, it's one interpretation, at least, of this uh, multiple drafts uh, account in a uh, in a, a source, a response to serve. On the other hand, if you want to you know, keep the mystery of consciousness uh, as something that has to be tackled, and you want to face this uh, scientific challenge, let's say, as we faced the origin of the universe, etc., etc., we can use science to do this. I'm, I'm saying this because, of course, the Big Bang. You know, someone can say, well, I'll go back to Kant. And how do you know what began uh, 13 uh, billions of uh, years ago with, uh, you know, the history of time itself? You can have a philosophical approach 
I'm not sure that physicists would, would find this satisfactory. You know, not, not to take into account all the uh, scientific contributions to a theory of time. But someone can say, well, I don't care about you know, the scientific account. I'm, I'm trying to come up with a metaphysical. Well, this is a philosophical assumption. I don't know if, if you can think of a presentation in a neuros... How, how would you uh, explain this distinction you just, you just drawing, Fabrizio? I don't know. Uh, uh, well... Uh, between uh, their and yeah. I, I, I would point at the question of self-preservation and the mimetic level on a presentational level. How, how this mimetic level is, is operative presentationally. And, and I don't think it is at stake with a phenomenological account if, if you want to say that all these physiological facts, the way that our physiology is operating regardless of our representations about our physiology, I don't think this is at conflict with phenomenology at all. I think that my problem is on the level of the narrative about choices later in this research, particularly when we get to the gambling tasks and when we get about the conclusions on the facts on the gambling tasks. But, you know, but the, the red screen, for example, the green screen, uh, 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 and the reactions to the screens. Mm -hmm. This is something that I, I would be curious to know more about because I, I would claim that, look, your reaction to this presupposes history. Uh, it, it's just, it, cannot be on a mimetic level. But, but the mass would agree with you. I, I don't see where, where you're having a, a problem there, because when, when I, I showed that uh, one of the first slides was the Libet experiment, precisely, when, when Libet came up with this experiment, right, and people started thinking, well, now, uh, you know, we, we, we are doing away with uh, the idea of our freedom, etc. This precisely was the mass and most people's reaction to say, no, wait a minute, it's not that simple precisely because here, okay, uh, because, you know, uh, it's not only, you know, this, try to follow the yellow spot, okay, you have these uh, four moments. This is uh, the fact that you measure something, it's like the fact that you find some spot in uh, any kind of uh, uh, experiment like using fMRI or any kind of a neuroimaging technology it's not that we're spotting what is causing the problem so we already talked about this we cannot assume that every correlation yeah, it's causal. is necessarily causal yeah, we're not doing this besides this is the problem it's a bad or poor reading it's a reductionist reading to think, well, you know, I here I have a, you know, a, a picture of my brain or something. Like this is what, no, this would be a, a mistake. But on the other hand, it would be equally misleading in a terrible mistake to say that there is no causality. Okay, so if I'm, I have a headache, what's the point of taking, uh, you know, pills or anything, painkillers? Because you don't believe in causality, and therefore, okay, you don't take a flu shot. What's the point? So, if someone want to go into, that, that's why you have extremes. If someone is so uh, subjectivist to the point of being a postmodern, saying, I don't see any use for science, this is all, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, crap, you know, theories. Well, this is a, it's, it's a possibility that you think so. But it's not going to change the size of the planet Earth, that there is a star, you know, around which the planet's revolving, etc. So, all the scientific endeavors and uh, theories and etc. they have been uh, developing throughout the ages. So I think we are trying to uh, strike some kind of balance between extreme positions that, for instance, I would say that German idealism is not only Cartesian, I think it's even worse than Cartesian. Uh, German idealism, especially uh, Kant's idealism, tends to be tends to be uh, quite reductive in certain readings of it. But I think that, interestingly enough, just Prince's theory of consciousness has some very interesting points of intersection with Kant's idea of a self-consciousness 
as being part of the very idea of consciousness being capable of determining itself, mm -hmm. right? Especially his idea of a perception. This was what uh, Husserl himself thought was a great insight into his own understanding of attentionality. So this is attentionality in Husserl is precisely what Prince was trying to come up with. The first time I read, uh, I heard Prince giving a talk was in Fortaleza. He gave a talk about his book, right? This was my question for him, and he said, well, I agree with, I, I have no problem with Husserl, except that the, the, the only problem with Husserl and Merleau-Ponty is that they remain within a phenomenological, philosophical account. They are not taking into account all the new theories, because, of course, 100 years ago, these were not available. You know, I can imagine that Husserl or Merleau-Ponty, they would be very much open to, uh, you know, learning new stuff from, uh, you know, neuroscientific, Findings. My problem with you, Chester, I have lots of problems right. with you, Chester, but one of the problems is that I can't see uh, what's, uh, what's the plus is, you know, that he has in relation to the amount of security. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that. there is a big. Uh, what do you think that's actually the plus? Because I oh, there, are, there are several problems. The first one is the Cartesian theater. Mm -hmm. But you can always say that, well, this was already in Dennett. Yes, it was in Dennett, but Damasio mentions Dennett. If you read uh, Descartes' error, there are several allusions to Dennett. But Damasio, nevertheless, he doesn't mind using the metaphor. Okay, it's only a metaphor. But for Prince, this is precisely what I was trying to, to put here. If you have this idea of the self in consciousness in this way, you are thinking in Kant, you are. Dualism. There is no way you're going to get rid of the idea of a noumenal self. <laughs> and I'm so aware of this because this was the very problem with John Rawls' theory of justice, right? This was the major reason why communitarians criticized John Rawls for using this expression, noumenal selves, right, in uh, section 40 of his a theory of justice. But precisely, the problem is that if you take the self is, uh, you know, this guy that's going to, well, let's take a seat and watch my movie here. You know, it's a homuncular idea of a selfhood. And I know that he's, uh, uh, Damasio is doing this for the sake of his argument, to speak of the emergence of a proto-self, selfhood, etc. But still, it, 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 it could be a problematic, because except uh, exactly when uh, you go into a... Uh, very uh, tricky problems, like uh, Prince is trying to make sense of, for instance, to say that when, uh, I'll give you an example, uh, even uh, in, in Kant's uh, examples, of course he didn't use a cell phone, but he say, well, here's a cell phone, and so everyone sees it, everyone perceives it, you, we focus, we use your attention to be aware and to be conscious of this object here. In Kantian terminology, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of Kant's example, he didn't use a cell phone because he didn't have cell phones in the 18th century. He used a palace, right? He said, if primitive people of the Americas, because this would be so-called Indians, right? Uh, Native Americans saw this single thing here. Of course, today if you take one of these to the Amazon and these guys will have, well, I have an iPhone much better than yours. But okay, let's assume that some tribe in a remote area of the Amazon. They've never seen a cell phone. And Kant's example is to say that you sold the cell phone to this uh, primitive Native American, and he or she will say, you see this? Yes, you see it. But you not see it as I see it, because you don't even know what the hell this is all about. No, what, what, what's this? This uh, black object here, a cell phone, right? So it's not only the act of a seeing, of perceiving. So this is the literal uh, division of uh, being aware or being conscious and making this as a conscious brain. So in Kant's uh, terminology, and the reason why I say there is uh, an approximation possible to be made with prints, is that Kant has a theory of representations. And Kant's idea of a Forstellung, which is very much the way uh, Husserl is going to develop, is that you start from the most abstract, sensible intuition, for instance, seeing, then you go into an empirical concept, then you go to pure 
concepts, all the way to get to the ideas. So the ideas are the most abstract forms of representations, like justice, uh, the social contract, equality, freedom. Right? Freedom is an idea. There is nothing in nature that is free. Right? There is nothing free in nature. There is no freedom in nature. This is Immanuel Kant at his best, right? But here, on the uh, phenomenal side, what's given is the most uh, concrete. The given. And this is what's precisely accessible. So the problem with this is that he kept this uh, theory of representation as a way to, to do the transcendental solution or transcendental uh, synthesis for uh, his theory of knowledge or cognition. To say that you need the sensible intuition plus the concept in order to come up with the understanding of uh, what things are. It's a theory of constitution. All the terminology in Husserl yeah. comes from Kant. Yeah, sure. yeah. But you are assuming that this is the philosopher doing this. So it's interesting that uh, Brent is going to re uh, resort to representation, etc., but he's already using representation as it's been developed by uh, psychologists, mm -hmm. cognitive psychology, for instance, in NetBlock, in uh, all the other accounts. It's already to think in terms of uh, experiments. So neuroimaging gave you some account of representation, precisely in the way that Damasio was talking about imaging, right? <laughs> Damasio also talks about imaging, in view of representation. But this is, aside from my point, you know, with Damasio, what's the difference? I can't see the difference between, you know. No, oh, it, it is a very, very, very slight yeah. uh, problems. But the reason why he is going to deal with each point of uh, divergence, where he's going to say, well, Damasio has an effort, but I have something else to say. It's a way of coming up with the different contributions okay. and having his own. Because the intermediate level, this is the point for the AR, AIR, right? Is to say that this intermediate level is somewhere between those things that are not picked out when you are saying that, uh, for instance, this is very typical in a conversation. The good example is uh, when you think of conversation. You can even think of uh, words that are said in a conversation, but you are not paying attention to uh, grammatical structures or to uh, even less to uh, semantic constructions. This is very much you know, something that uh, we, we can relate to, uh, to Norman's presentations on Chomsky. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because in, in these things, it's like those things that uh, they could be unconscious. You know, you're not paying attention to them. With hearing, it's not different. If we stop now for a second, can you hear the bird? Now you start focusing your attention on other things. But all these noises, they were already here, even though you are not paying attention to them. So you have extremes. One extreme is, is going all the way to, uh, to make attention already you know, uh, reducible uh, or reductible to uh, sensible intuition. Another extreme is to say that it's all just because they were there and it was not present. In Prince is consider all of them because in a neuromarketing is a good example. You can say, well, right, you didn't pay attention that these guys were drinking Coca-Cola. And at the end of the day, they say, well, I don't know why I keep drinking Coke, right? And someone says, well, this is very subtle, you know, uh, technique that these guys use, you know, in, uh, commercials or in a soap opera on television and people you know, don't even realize that they were you know, subconsciously, so whatever you call subconsciously, being fed by these you know, commercial uh, tricks, you can say that this is already something that has to do with attention. So uh, Prince is trying to, uh, to, to fine tune whatever would be these intermediate levels of attentionality. Okay? It's very easy to understand that attention say, well, can you see this point here and can you focus on this little point somewhere? Well, this is a, a very precise, simple, uh, trivial example of uh, attentionality. But you can have uh, other 
uh, ways. And, and this example of the Native American is interesting uh, for Kant, except that his explanation is to say that the, uh, the Native Americans in this uh, example, in this illustration, I have to stop here, they, uh, they had the faculty of understanding, imagination, etc. But since they were not exposed to this training, they didn't come to develop this transcendental uh, synthesis of uh, you know, uh, concept formation with sensible intuition. Already in his first book, Prince, of course, is, is dealing in a different way with the, the idea of concept. In his understanding, it can't be that idealized as it is in, a, uh, in Kant. And I, I would concede that in Husserl is already much more, let's say, towards the concrete. It's even, this is the way the French, the French uh, summarized this whole movie. They said, vers le concret, right? Towards the concrete. This was the name that Jean Val gave to this uh, three H movement. So with Hegel's critique of Kant, you, you, you start this movement towards the concrete. And with Husserl, this is radicalizing the return to the things themselves, yeah. right? But it's still, he needs categorical intuition. Yeah, I, I, again, uh, like, we, we can have a know, long I, conversation about this, but I'm not convinced that you know, the, uh, the philosopher, if he's not taking what's coming out from a scientific experiment uh, into account, even though, I, as I said, I'm, I'm sure that Husserl, Melopoly, they, they would be the first one to say, well, I'm willing to, you know, to take this into uh, consideration. But a theory of a, of a constitution, if it's already with uh, certain assumptions, in, in the case of Husserl, as far as I understood, he doesn't get rid of his uh, theory of representation. I don't know if, if, uh, if you have a different uh, reading. Of, as far as I can tell, in the logical investigations and all the way he goes towards uh, his literal writings, it's always a theory of representations. Representation here has become much more complicated uh, in, in Prince, for instance. Already in the first volume of his trilogy, we, because, for instance, he's not assuming that you cannot have thought without language. For instance, this is a very important point. Okay? And for concepts, if you say, you have the concept of a zebra, you know, they even have uh, experiments to show how the concept of a zebra emerges in the brain. Okay? You, you can think uh, of all different kinds of uh, accounts, and you can even have phenomenological accounts to think how Africans would think about zebras, okay? But uh, nevertheless, what is at stake here is the very way you, you, uh, you develop this uh, theory of universals. In a very, uh, let's say, uh, simplistic way, uh, as I use that slide opposing a Plato to a Hume, in Platonic understanding, you have the form, the eternal form or idea of what a zebra is like, right? So this would be one extreme to say that you have this conception of things prior to human thinking about them. Another extreme, like empiricists said, is that you have all these uh, process, cultural process, evolutionary process where you are constructing a concepts and conceptions. But in neurobiological terms, of course, you, you, you need some kind of account for uh, concepts. How do concepts arise? How does language arise uh, in the brain? So this is more you know, uh, recent uh, approaches to, uh, to this problem. I, I won't take, I won't speak any longer. Please, uh, Sinara. She's going to give her presentation. She's going to need a PowerPoint, right? Yeah.